And welcome back. This is episode four. I am Abir. And I am Doug. I want to welcome everyone to Real Talk, our space. Yes. And before we begin, Doug, today is episode four. That means we've been doing this for a month straight. So happy one month anniversary to our show. Happy anniversary. Thank you. And Where's happy my anniversary gift? to all those. So we have some who've done four with us. So yes. thank you for those that have been down since day one and are still with us. Yes. Bring on all your other friends. You know, we've yes, got a lot yes. of room. Got plenty of space. Got a lot of space. Yeah. But um, my husband knows I'm greedy. And every time we have an anniversary or something, there's a gift. So I'm just letting you know. Chris Rock said you can't take a woman back in lifestyle. So happy one month anniversary, Douglas. Thank you. Okay. Your happy so- anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so today we have a show that I've been waiting to do ever since I was introduced to Uh the book and to the author and authors. So we are talking about Stamped. Yes, these are all my little nuggets. I know, Doug, you're going to laugh at me because they're not even the same size or whatever, but this is how I read. Like, I can't read, and you know that I really devoured this book because look at this, okay? So if y'all need any notes, this is where it is. So we're talking about Stamped, which is a spin from the original book by Ibram Kindi. And then taken by young author uh, Jason Reynolds, who took it and said he his specific words, and I'm going to ad lib a little bit what he said, was he wanted to take Ibram Kindi's book, and he's a professor, so his is more scholarly, and create a book that whether you're a middle schooler or if you're 80 years old, everybody would be able to enjoy it. And I think Jason Reynolds did a phenomenal job with the book. I know he has a middle school background. Yay, middle school, because I am a middle school teacher. Whoop, whoop. Special Uh people, special place, all in it. And you really could feel it in the book. And I was also the type who, I love Jason Reynolds' voice. He's a phenomenal storyteller. So I also listened to the book while I read it. And again, you can feel that middle school vibe. And I'm like, wow. If I only had this when I was teaching eighth grade, I oh, think wow. we this would be our entire curriculum for the year, which right. is what and we're going to talk he, about today. Right. And he calls, um, Reynolds calls it a remix, right? Of yes. Kendi's remix. Um, so we know we love that language, right? Yes, we, we sure do. So so that was my take. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to see Ibram Kindi and Jason Reynolds speak together in D.C. a couple of months ago, which for me was, you know, I'm a big fangirl. So I was fangirling, but just being in that energy and listening to how everything took place and how important this book has become to mm-hmm. people, uh, it was nice to be there. So that was my experience with Stamp. How about you? Right. So I, I came, um, became aware of it, really um, heard about uh, Dr. Kendi first. Um, shout out to, uh, I'm going to shout out Ken Patterson. And um, Ken was going on on Twitter about, he's, he was at an event with um, Dr. Kendi talking about his book, How to Be Anti-Racist. And mm. then that led to a conversation I had with another good good friend of mine, Corey Carter. Um, Corey. And he told me about um, shout out to Corey. So he mm-hmm. put me on to an event at Hopkins in September 2019, where um, Dr. Kendi was having a discussion um, around um, how to be anti-racist or mm-hmm. dialogue. And actually moving back, you know, moving kind of nonlinear. Before that, I heard about uh, Reynolds' book a long way down, heard, you know, rave reviews. And then I saw him being interviewed by uh, Trevor Noah mm-hmm. and really just, you know, very gripping. So I went to the library, got the book, loved that book. Very mm-hmm. strong. Like you said, intended for a young audience, mm-hmm. young adults. Great book. I just thought just the storytelling, everything very so vivid. Right. And then um, after seeing Dr. Kendi, um, hearing about this remix that they were going to do together, couldn't wait to get my hands on it. And you and I mm-hmm. had some discussion because, yeah, I'm, I'm not looking forward to reading history books. Per se. That's not my thing. Um, I won't be offended, but okay. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But like you said, the spin that they put on it and Mm -hmm. what they did to it was huge. I actually got the book. I actually got it from you. You lent me your copy, uh, your signed copy, which I really appreciate. Mm -hmm. And um, I started reading it during the quarantine time. Yep. um, Stay at the home order. And then I was so moved. I ordered another from a local bookstore. I never Mm -hmm. forget they delivered it to my doorstep because like I got to have my own copy of this book. It's huge. And I just tore through it. And it's a it's a it's a masterpiece, I think. Right. So. Um, it, it goes like to said, show it, what um, Jason Reynolds is like, because from the very beginning, this is his famous quote. Uh-huh. Before we begin, let's get something straight, a, a testament to what you were saying. This is not a history book. I repeat, this is not a history book. Now, he has a nice, deep voice, and he says it more well <laughs> than I do. At least not the ones you're used 
to reading in school, stamped page one. Absolutely. This book is about history, but not in the same format as a history book, which is what makes it also more appealing to people who don't like to read and always right. thought of history as, you know, like I always call it dead white men or dates or battles. Mm -hmm. And we don't really get into the nitty gritty and the minutia of how things right. work. So, um, so today, this is why I'm excited because anybody who knows me knows how much I love this book. And, you know, shameless plug, if you go to my website, which I'll share later, I have a free ebook that you can use. It's wonderful for the book stamp. So we have two amazing guests. <laughs> and what's awesome is the, the two guests are also sisters. And Seven Degrees of Separation, one of them, um, her daughter and my daughter are good friends. So, you know, it's a small world. And they're also from Chicago. Whoop, whoop. Whenever mm -hmm. I can have people from my city represent here in Baltimore, I'm always happy. So we would like to bring on our show. We have the amazing Erica Thomas and Valerie Graham. Welcome, ladies, to the welcome, show. Welcome. Thank you for having us. Thank <laughs> you. So could you give us just a brief intro to who you are, what you do, so forth and so on? Sure, I'll start. Uh, my name is Erica Thompson. I am Assistant Head of School for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at St. Patrick's Episcopal Day School, uh, located in Washington, D.C., and I've been in teaching in independent schools for over 20 years. Wow, thank you for your service. <laughs> and I am Valerie Graham. I have also been teaching for about 20 years, uh, public and private school. I started um, with public schools in Alabama and then Baltimore. And when I was about to burn out, I went back to school to become a school librarian. The title has now changed to media specialist, but I've been uh, either teaching or a librarian in public schools, private schools, and the women's prison in Maryland. Yeah, I do remember you, that stint you had with the women's prison, and you work for Howard County Public Schools now, correct? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you, ladies, for being on the show. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Welcome. And let's get it started. Um, Erica, you talked about your title, but let's dig a little deeper. Yes. Head of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, I believe is what you said. So yes. let's break it down for the, for the lay people. What, okay. does that actually, what, what does that mean? What do, you, what do you do? Right. What's the purpose? of that? Position? Right. Right. So I'm part of the senior ad administrative team for my school. So some of that is, you know, lots of day to day stuff, fun stuff like carpool. But as far mm -hmm. as the diversity and inclusion part, it really is um, a big part of this hiring. So trying to think mm -hmm. about our faculty um, and staff being diverse, uh, admission, thinking about our student body being diverse, and um, then curriculum and professional development. So mm -hmm. in our curriculum, are we cover looking at all perspectives? Are we, you know, looking at the literature that we read? Um, and then professional development for the te our teachers. Are they, you know, doing some unconscious bias? Um, investigation? Are they thinking about being more culturally competent, you know, helping them work through uh, difficult conversations with students? So that's sort of my day to day life. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. So you do cover the staff, the faculty and staff end, as well as the student piece. That's right. Talk about. Okay. okay. So if you're talking about diversity, are we looking at specific demographics? Are you looking just at race? What do you talk about when you're specifically talking about equity and diversity right. in your school? We really talk about all of that. So the school is uh, predominantly white mm. uh, and affluent. And so, you know, we're always looking to be more diverse um, socioeconomically, mm. racially, um, as far as equity. Um, even we're an Episcopal school, but we'd like to be religiously diverse. Um, so we talk about all of those things. We also have some gender expression and sexuality difference. And so we talk about all of those things and try to work with our teachers around that. Oh, wow. That does include a lot. Yes. <laughs> and it's always evolving. Right. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Valerie, you are a library media specialist. So like you said, librarian. And that term, like when I think of librarian, when I was growing up, you know, lady majority of the time is a lady classes and the you know gets you your books but now that <laughs> that role has totally evolved okay. so can you tell us a little bit about that evolvement and you know what your role is as a library media specialist as well sure um we started out kind of as a literature specialist hmm. um, find you the right book and we knew exactly where it was in the building right <laughs> that was a big deal but now uh we are information specialists Hmm. We have to be able to gather information from a lot of different sources. And also, um, as a teaching media specialist, I make sure that children know 
all those different types of resources and how to use them, how to uh, synthesize the information, how to produce it in uh, some way that they can share it with the rest of the world. So it has taken on a lot of technology uh, skills as well. Got it. All right. And technology is Doug's field, technically. Right, right, right. <laughs> I don't know everything about books. <laughs> <laughs> well, we yeah, are today talking about a book. Go ahead. Yeah, about I guess on those lines, like I remember, like so when I was in school, it was, it was the library, and then you know, like I said, brought out the media. Can you talk about from your perspective how how the role of you know that job has shifted with this you know infusion of technology that's happening now, mm -hmm. or it's been happening, I guess. Well, it, it has changed what I need to make sure children know before they go. I'm in elementary right now. I'm, I'm certified for K through 12, but I've been uh, teaching in elementary. So before students go to middle school, I make sure that they know how to handwrite a citation and how to find citation machines to write citations. <laughs> um, so we don't do everything paper-based. We make sure that they know everything about technology. It's become a technology teacher. And in fact, next year, my classes will be split 50-50 between information literacy and mm. actual technology skills. Wow. Okay. Okay. Because we know I have children, you know, of my own, and they are not as tech-lit. I mean, they're not as tech-lit as what they think they are. You know, they may be able to go on TikTok or create all these <laughs> weird videos, but, you know, teach them how to save a file or open a file, like basic things they really don't know how to do. So uh, it's, it's a big task. We spend a lot of money making sure that kids can do that in Howard County. So I'm very lucky to be in that county. Good. Appreciate it. Right. I think we talked about this on an earlier show, right? But, you know, we talk about like kids being tech savvy or, you know, techno technolo technology natives. But like you said, a lot of times their experience is around, you know, gadgets and games, right? So I'm thinking like in our age bracket, we came into it, you know, like we mm -hmm. went from a typewriter to a word processor, right? You know, spreadsheets made math calculations easier. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it is important to point out, like without the guidance of an educator, of a media specialist, you know, students might think that, you know, not they might just live in that space or stay in that space where it's only to be, you know, an inter a form of entertainment. So mm -hmm. just want to say as technology grows. Yeah. I just think that role is very important. So critical now because there's so much on the internet. Mm -hmm. Where I think when, when I was growing up, you knew the encyclopedia had been vetted and that information was correct. And right. now any you know wacko can put out a website. And so mm -hmm. really the idea of being you know really critical of your use of the technology, I think is important. Right, right. And like you exactly. said, the information that exists, exactly, because it's right there, right? Um, and it's not all good information or all valid or right. reliable. Mm -hmm. Yep. Very good. All right, so we're going to dig into the book a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. So we're all here to talk about Stamped. So want to hear from you all. What's, what's your description of Stamped? Um, but can you do it in one sentence? That's, that's the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so whoever um, wants to go I'm going to take a line from, from Cindy. He, uh, he was interviewed by the woman who did uh, 1619. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he wanted to turn his... Um, his version of the book, Stamp from the Beginning, into yep. um, nonfiction novel. Mm -hmm. That is oh, like that. what Jason knew that it reads like fiction. It's easy, yes. to read, but yep. it is all information. It yep. is an amazing blend of the two styles, and, and Jason was the best person for that. Yeah. I was thinking it was um, it was a history lesson, but also like a challenge, like mm. um, a challenge to all that you had been taught and indoctrinated in. Mm. So yeah, I looked at it, I learned a lot just historically, but also I had to, you know, wrestle with some stuff myself. So I found it right. to be, yeah, a challenge in that way. Right. Mm, that's a, that's and a good one. Abir, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, launching off of those, those two points, agree completely. Um, and if you look at the subtitle of the book, it is, was it racism? I think racism, anti-racism, and you. And you. Uh -huh. Remember, a lot of what I read speaks exactly to what Erica just mentioned, that it is, this book is about you. I remember him saying that, like, this is about you as the reader. Um, and I love that piece that Valerie mentioned. I hadn't even heard him describe it as mm -hmm. such, uh, you know, um, what is it, a nonfiction novel? Is that description? Yes. Um, and true. Like you said, I, I couldn't put it down. You just, yeah. you just mm -hmm. it's a page turner. Like, absolutely. And I... There's no history book I know of that reads like that. So, <laughs> no, I, I agree. I mean, it was, it, and 
you have to find a person who can take your work and still be uh, loyal to it mm -hmm. and not dilute it. And Jason Reynolds, again, you know, props to him for creating such an amazing book out of such a heavy topic too. Like this is not an easy topic mm -hmm. to discuss. So this is not a topic that is also something that people now everybody is talking about how to be anti-racist. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, it took horrific social unrest for it to get to where we are, but it's also not an easy topic. But again, when you read the book and you listen to it, it's something that is, I hate to say it this way, but it's easily digestible. You mm -hmm. look at it and you take it in pieces and you can process it and you're like, okay, now I see how this happened and why this happened. So, which actually, um, you know, leads us to our next question. Uh, Amir, can I jump uh, yeah. in? I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. Only it's really coupled to this. I'm just checking out the chat. Yes. Really segues off your last point. Um, got a comment um, from Stephanie. She's saying it's an anti-racist book that all ages can understand. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's no small feat, right? To take mm -hmm. something, you know, we read it as, as adults. He intended it for, you know, a young adult audience. Um, and it's right. It was complex enough. It, it, was, it was everything it needed to be. And also her other comment was about it led her on her journey through anti-racist lit. And I think we're about to get into that a little bit here in a few minutes, but just if you look at the comprehensive nature of, of this book, the scope of it, um, coupled with the readability. So mm -hmm. um, I thought that was really right on point as far as um, kind of launching off from where we were starting with what the book meant. Uh, yeah, it was, it is, that's a good point. I mean, I would think it did take people on many journeys, which leads us to our next question, which is, what would you think would be the favorite part section or even quote from the book? So we'll have you two ladies talk <laughs> about it and then Doug and I will jump in and then we'll see if we have things in common. Oh gosh. Yeah. So I think my, just to start my favorite part that I think I'll use the most is just his definitions, mm. like right beginning, his definitions of a segregationist and a yes. simulationist and yep. an anti-racist. I can see myself using those, over and over again. And then of course, in true Jason Reynolds style, you know, he breaks it down to a hater, you know, <laughs> <laughs> your, uh, your uh, first day, whatever. Right. You know, so he breaks it down. Um, and I like when he said, um, you know, assimilationist likes you because you're like them. Mm -hmm. like Anti-racist person likes you because you are like you. Like mm -hmm. that really stuck with me. Mm. Yeah. That's really good. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to savor that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Valerie? I like um, a few things about the book. Um, the graphic quality of the way he wrote it, mm. I think, is really helpful for young people when they read it. Um, I heard him speak in an interview about how it was written and how he knows he's competing with electronic resources, mm -hmm. um, things that move quickly, like video. And so the book is not written just in one text. It has lists and things that, uh, um, words that are written bigger and smaller. Mm -hmm. It has a graphic quality to attract attention to really important information. And I think that's gonna be wonderful when I get to share it with students at some point. Um, I don't know any young people who have read this yet, but I wanna know if they're as excited about this book as I am. The content, content wise, I really appreciated reading, and this goes to Erica's point about like learning things and having to evaluate what I know already. The mm -hmm. book Washington and W. E. B. Du Bois, uh, the Black Thinkers, and describing them, and yes, do I have to take sides. Do I have to take sides now that it's all historical? And I, I almost think you do in order to move forward and come up with what our plan is for the future. Right. Wow. Very, very well said. Um, all of those is what you, and I, it's true. I mean, we don't talk about just the semantics of a book either, but yeah, it is. It's almost like um, they took a graphic designer and put it together mm -hmm. because as you read it, it was also engaging to look at and to read and to see the different fonts and the different styles. So yeah, um, I like that. Doug, what was your favorite part of the book? Um, so I'm going to cheat a little bit. Um, <laughs> I, I like the, the, I guess the book in totality and I guess because to me, it, that's what really did it for me. It's, it's a book that was, it spanned about 600 plus years mm -hmm. of history. It did it in this concise manner with mm -hmm. tremendous storytelling. I will tell you that first section or first chapter, the world's, I think the story of the world's first racist. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Zura-ra. 
Right. I mean, so just to, I mean, that's bold, right? For that to be, so I'm, you know, I know about racism or I think I might know about racism, but I've never heard a claim of this, the first race, the world's first racist. So right. not, not the first races in the U S the world's first race. Mm-hmm. Um, and not, you know, the, the last races we heard about the first races, right? So this bold claim. And then really from there, I think the book just delivered. So um, covering 600 odd years of history, um, I don't want to call them highlights. I put that in quotes, but like, you know, highlights of racism is right. really what the book, you know, pointed out and just created this thread and this yarn throughout history um, and connecting right up to the present. And, you know, as was said, you know, by, you know, Valerie and Erica, it, it drew you in personally. Like it, it, it brought you into the book. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I'm going to cheat a little bit, say like the book in totality, but if I had to take a part, I would say maybe the first part, because as soon as I read that first chapter. Like I said, I was, I was sold and mm-hmm. it's just something I couldn't put down, you know, right. as far as the whole book. Yeah. Well, how about also, you? It also in the first chapter, I mean, I like the entire book. I'm not going to mm-hmm. lie. Like it's <laughs> sort of like Sophie's choice. I don't know which part I like more than <laughs> others. Right. Um, in regards to the very first racist, but it's fascinating to hear about how even in Europe, Eastern Europeans were considered not white if you're Romanian or Slavic mm-hmm, or what mm-hmm. have you, and then they would be considered the slaves at the time until this dude Zurara came along with this in- invention of slavery. And yep. which is, is, is fascinating because nobody sits there and thinks like, you know, we, unfortunately we grew up with racism. So we just think it's always been there, but it's, it is a construct. But mm-hmm. I think going back to what Valerie was saying about choosing sides, I think for me, this dude yeah. was the one <laughs> that I was just like, man, I'm so disappointed. But the amazing thing about the book is this. For me, is the fact that growing up, um, W.E. Du Bois is the epitome of black thought, you know, and um, the epitome of uh, education and doing better for yourself, all of that. Now, growing up also, I never really paid attention to the fact that, you know, skin color was a factor for him. Um, you know, the talented 10th was a factor for that. But also the contrast to that was bringing in Marcus Garvey. Right. And the thing I love about this book is the fact that all the people that in traditional textbooks have been demonized or looked at as radical, their personalities totally shift in this book. I will never look at Marcus Garvey the same again. I grew up thinking he was this eccentric dude from New York. You know, I, I think of Jamaican descent, um, mm. just a total radical guy. And then how he was, in my perspective, just from this book, how he was really more true to the cause as an anti-racist and W.E.B. Du Bois as a, a simul- assimilationist. I really had to sit with that for a while. I really had to sit with that for a while because it's sort of like, you know, this person who you've looked up to for a long time and then you realize, you know, they weren't as great as you think they are. So I think for me, it was, it was that. Right. And Abir, I got some thoughts on that. I got to be careful because I don't want, I mean, we know Du Bois is a giant, right? Within, But like to your point, and history does this, you have someone, so remember they talked about Du Bois moving from assimilationist to Mm anti-racist. Garvey didn't do that. Garvey showed up as, as anti-racist from the from the from get-go. The beginning, yep. But he was radical and he was very mm-hmm. unapologetically black. Mm-hmm. And like you said, from Jamaica. So the history we're taught, you know, this this history that's draped in whiteness, you 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 really can't magnify somebody like that mm-hmm. and maintain mm-hmm. this this white supremacist stronghold on our, our minds, if you will. So I, I love the way, like you said, that. They, they, they made they, they were human beings in this book. Mm-hmm. They, they, was, they were they were fleshed out characters who happened to be historical figures and they weren't cartoonish and, and they weren't, you know, one dimensional. And it caused you to do like you had to do with the boys. Had you had you grapple with this, right. this historical figure. So, um, yeah, I really appreciate that about the book. Um, mm-hmm. If I could just um, want a couple comments because mm-hmm. along these same lines. So, um, you know, uh, I think this is Elena saying um, <laughs> highlighted the death and extreme measures taken in order to institute and maintain racism and racist beliefs. Mm-hmm. So again, does this over again, an historical period, 600 odd years. Um, another comment I saw she made. Um, yep. Yeah, and so, so hard talked about this too, right? So, mm-hmm. right. Watered down black scholars and, and, and historians and activists, folks that 
frankly, have just been marginalized within you know, the United States public school system study of history. Um, and now these folks are centered and they're, they're really put in front of us um, again in, in their full dimension, uh, multiple dimensions, if you will. Um, so, you know, those are some of the comments along those same lines. I guess, you know, some of our, our guests or our, our um, folks who are in the chat talking about what this book means to them. So um, one of the things I want to mention, I think before uh, I don't want to lose sight of this, a lot of talk about Jason Reynolds as a storyteller. And I know I listened to him read, um, what was it? Um, Look Both Ways, mm -hmm. one of his books, mm -hmm. which I haven't picked up yet. The short tremendous, stories. The short stories, mm -hmm. a tremendous storyteller. And I read the book. I'm going to look listen to the audio book of Stamp. Mm -hmm. But I would tell folks, if you're about to get into this book, to me, you can't go wrong. I haven't listened to the audio book, but people rant and rave about it. Phenomenal. And I think Eric is on the right. So you're looking at something. I mean, this is something special, to say the least. Mm -hmm. And a special historian and Dr. Kendi and a special storyteller um, and, and um, Jason Reynolds. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I think I would like to ask also to you two ladies as well, and Doug as well. And we always talk about this. Stephanie makes a good point. He did evolve. Mm -hmm. He did evolve when he also kind of got burned. That's the way I look at it. Oh, yeah. He finally realized what he was working for, who he was working for was not the same mm -hmm. as what he's the whole entire struggle. So for me, as an, you know, Muslim Arab female in this country, I think my own beliefs have evolved as well, depending on who I'm talking to or who I hang out with. And, you know, with age also, you know, hopefully you become wiser. So have you two, even you, Doug, gone through this evolution of you may have thought one way and then something happened or you've come across something or experience in your life that made you evolve into who you are today? Uh, I think that... Um that although he evolved, this book is some of the first information I've seen about that. And his mm -hmm. assimilationist ideas have really stuck with my parents' generation. And mm -hmm. I know that I was raised that way. Yeah. And Interesting. So after reading the book, I really have to think through some of the things that I think and the way that I behave in the world where mm -hmm. I do make so much adjustment to be like them so that I can get ahead in what I was raised to think is kind of their world. One of the mm. things my dad used to say is go make the white people's money. Mm. Wow. Wow. <laughs> the assimilationist in that mm -hmm. think about what you're gonna go do. Yeah, I think being raised middle class black, you know, in the city, we we what is what's the phrase he uses upsuasion. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yes. Uh, victims of persuasion. We were taught, you know, if you get your education and you can talk like they talk and <laughs> you that's how you're successful. And it did. Um, there was some separation of yourselves from, you know, other black people, I think, in that way. So I think when I talked about at the beginning that this book challenged me, mm -hmm. I think that was really where it hit me. I think this idea of, you know, this is definitely how we were raised and Right. We have to challenge that thinking and how how we move forward. Wow. Right. So, Abir, I think when you asked that question, I don't know if you noticed, I kind of froze. I was like, what? <laughs> and then <laughs> Valerie and Erica, thank you all for jumping in. Um, <laughs> because at the same time, I'm going to shout out my man, Joe. Joe was in the chat. And while you were asking that question, I don't know if you saw it. He said, I appreciate the insight to the evolution of their thinking. It's so mm -hmm. easy to fall to a pattern of assimilation. Mm -hmm. And the guests talked about that. And I really appreciate what you all shared. Same thing, growing up middle class, mm -hmm. and we, we, we keep it personal, local, and immediate. We speak from our lived experience, absolutely. And I'm not saying my parents raised me to be an assimilationist, mm -hmm. but it, it's, I, I, I love the way, you know, Valerie put it. It's right. I mean, it's, and also it turns into the, the politics, the respectability politics, mm -hmm. um, which does not work, right? So I'm going to say it now, I'll probably say it every week. It does not work. Another colleague, shout out to one of my colleagues, Lisa. She talks about the racism's coming. Like mm -hmm. you can dress yourself up. And this is what Du Bois found out, right? You can yes. you can you can dress to the nines. You can speak the king's language English. Mm -hmm. You come up with whatever method you that you think you have to to fully assimilate and be accepted up against racism, that's not gonna work. Right. Um, right. so that evolution, and yeah, for me, it was, I'm gonna tell you, for me. And I'm not, you know, I feel like I'm on like the, the you know, the, the therapist couch now. Like, you know, <laughs> like I was telling folks like with 30 the minutes home, the quarantine, yeah, I've tapped more into myself, who I am, mm -hmm. reading books like this, talking to guests like we have today, 
you know, just really fortifying myself and, and realize like, yeah, I'm going to just like, you know, Reynolds says, you know, you had to like me for me. Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, I do not like me as an assimilationist. That does not because now I realize like what, you know, the book helps you realize that, too. Like if you're if you're an assimilationist, this is basically what you're in for. This is right. what history has taught us. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, that 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 question cuts deep up there. So, um <laughs> yeah, I, I could I could go on take a breath. I'm not gonna do that, but um, <laughs> I think that's a that's a very very deep question. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, because it goes back to what that book through. means. The book helps you look at it. It really gives you insight to yourself. Right. I mean, yeah. we do all evolve as people. Um, it's always a very different experience for those who are living it every day, mm-hmm. as opposed to me, for example, as an Arab American. You know, people already look at us as quote unquote foreign, regardless mm-hmm. of what we are, and my husband always has to give my daughters that quote unquote lecture as no matter what you do at the end of the day, they're still going to consider you Arab. Mm. No matter how, what you, how you say it, Doug, no matter what you wear, what you, how you speak, yeah. so forth and so on. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, the show is all about real talk and right. it's a learning experience. And I appreciate, um, your willingness to be, I guess, vulnerable and speak about, um, those topics. So, which leads us since we're talking about, mm-hmm depth and knowledge this leads us to our next question <laughs> right so um there was, we alluded to this before um book that made a big impact for us and and one thing i did realize through our discussion right i know a lot of adults who read the book mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. but i don't know any young people who mm-hmm. read the book so um thinking along those lines um should this book be a part of the middle grades curriculum um mm-hmm. and if, if, if it should be why should it be and if well, it should be tell me why it shouldn't be my plan is that everybody in my sixth through eighth grade is going to read it next year at my school. <laughs> so um, I will let you know. I have to come back. We'll do another show. <laughs> yeah, <That's, laughs> absolutely. Right. I don't up. know young people that have read it. I know some that are reading it this summer. Um, but for for me, I think for the white students, I think just the historical part is so important. I think mm-hmm. to see how much energy was put into this. Um, continued indoctrination of white supremacy. Like there was a lot of effort made to keep that uh, narrative going. And I think they need to hear that because I think, you know, a lot of our, my white students would say, you know, of course I know we're all equal and I have my black friends and I love them. But um, at the same time, they also notice, you know, look at these neighborhoods, look at, they look different. Why Mm -hmm. is our school mostly white? So Mm -hmm. there's (laughs) to see that there's a historical uh, narrative that was put in place that is playing out and that is what you are living. I think they need to know that. Um, And then for my black students, I want them to know that as well. Um, But also hear some of those stories of resilience and, Mm -hmm. um, and, and have ways to push back. Mm. Being able to quote some of that history. I think that's really important. What do you mean by pushback though? So I think if a white person were to say, you just need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, mm. they could say, well, let me explain to you <laughs> the five reasons why that's problematic, right? Right. right. Just yep. like Dr. Bettina. Well, I think we quote her every show of ours. But she, <laughs> she, you we know, owe I her think, royalties, right? We, I know, we do. She talks <laughs> about grit and how yeah. that's pretty much the same thing. You know, right. we're talking right. about grit. So, wow. Very, thank you. Yeah. Valerie. I do think it should be part of the curriculum and I want to know how it goes with sixth through eighth because it has a lot to it and I don't know how much sixth through eighth graders can handle and digest it and really be able to take take the information and move forward with it. I think it should absolutely be in high school. Mm. Um, That is where um, they're about to go out into a more independent uh, way of experiencing the world. And they really need to know what they're gonna face. And I think having that background, that history, and that the idea that you are, there's nothing wrong with you. Mm -hmm. It is the world around you and how it functions that could make you feel feel a certain way, but that with this information, you might be armed to do better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, High schoolers, think are really, really going to benefit this from this. But so so does everybody. I mean, I have mm-hmm. it to every teacher group I can find because they need to know just like I need to know. Right. I was thinking about like a lesson on just like Thomas Jefferson. He was a good guy, exclamation point, or Thomas Jefferson. He was a good guy, question mark. <laughs> I think that, that could be a debate 
um, that you could have for a long time. I mean, he is, you know, you think, I, I just heard a quote the other day that, that said, some people aren't racist, but racism is not a deal breaker for them. Yes. Mm. And I don't yeah. agree with that, by the oh. way. But okay. <laughs> right. And so you think about voting right now. Yes. Right? Like, well, I'm not racist. I don't like his racist ideas, but mm -hmm. it's not a deal breaker for me because, mm -hmm. of, you know, the economy or whatever the other case may be. <laughs> but to look at someone like Thomas Jefferson and, you know, really be able to talk about was he a great guy? And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So, um, so let me, let me, all right, because you guys are, I get, I get, he's rubbing his hands. I mean, I know, right? Every, every, good. Yeah, it always, right. So, <laughs> where's, where's the hand rubbing moment? Okay. So, uh, Valerie, you talked about, um, you know, age appropriateness, right? Um, it seems like everybody agrees that high school students can deal with some of this. Sure. Middle school, we have a little debate. We do have some comments saying that, you know, six ways. So, it could be a debate. Here's what's coming up for me, because a couple questions. Number one, um, how much of it is a question of the students being ready versus the teachers being ready? And I'm going to tell you what's coming up for me. Um, and it's in the chat, and Valerie mentioned it. I went to visit a college course, okay? It was a community college history course. And we had some high school students that were early college students. And it was, I'm going to racialize it. It was a white man teaching um, and this class, it was all black students. Mm -hmm. And he was running through, um, I don't know, it was like a U.S. history class, American, American government, whatever it was. But he made a comment about Thomas Jefferson. He's like, you know, I have um, like a man crush on Thomas Jefferson. Mm -hmm. One of the students was like, didn't he own slaves? Mm -hmm. And the teacher never responded. So I could not leave the classroom. Like I was supposed to be there visiting with some other pros. I had to stop and go talk to this guy. Mm -hmm. And that was part of my journey because I don't think I pushed it far enough, but I did challenge him on like, you said this, mm -hmm. this comment was made, can we unpack that? Can we interrogate that comment? And then he went to this thing about, well, I know there were some problems with Thomas Jefferson, but like, do you realize like, for you to stand up in front of a, a group of black students, because one of two things is happening. Those students don't know that history, or like in this case, somebody knew it and called it out mm -hmm. and you didn't say anything. So like, I guess I think about that when I think about what's in stamp, right? So, right. like Val, you gave that one, right? You said that one example. So I'm just thinking. I, I want to get your your take on that as, as educators too, and educators who work with a range of other educators. What's your sense on how educators? I would say of any race. How do how do you feel about them actually facilitating discussions with students of any age around the, around this this book and this content? I think black educators are ready. <laughs> I uh, participate in some um, some black educator Facebook groups and people are ready. They have wanted to say mm -hmm. things and never felt like they could say them. And they're hoping that this is the opportunity. I know that in Howard County, there are a group of teachers working on revising the entire social studies curriculum, uh, starting with high school and going backwards. So they're ready. Black teachers are ready. Um Erica, you want to talk about the white teacher? Yeah. <laughs> We're getting ready. <laughs> no, um, you know, and I do think that their white teachers feeling more motivated than they mm -hmm. were six months ago, even. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so um, um, I'm hopeful. Um, I do think we'll need, you know, some scaffolding, some practice, some role mm -hmm. that needs to happen to get more comfortable. But I, I think we can get ready. Okay. Okay. I like that. How about, oh, can I just... Yeah, yeah, along these same lines. So you all gave great, I, I, you know, hopefully with this energy you all are given, like it'll be within, you know, you all have a purview. You all can get it to where, you know, educators you work with can get into this book and hopefully we'll see this spread uh, more widely. Is there any reason you all can think that this should not be a part of the curriculum? Mm. Uh, we talked about it can be some challenging content. Any, anything that you would say, you know, any reason you can think this should not be a part of the curriculum? Mm -hmm. Any reason why? I think so. I think Jason nailed this history it is written beautifully in a way where, where uh, I think one of you used the word digestible, like if you take it in small parts and, and really get a chance to talk about every part of it, I don't think there's anything in there that's inappropriate. It is shocking. It's shocking to the grownups, which is why I recommend they read it first. Yep. But it is, uh, I, I think this is the format that everybody is ready for. Nice, nice. Yep. Good point. Um, yep. Sahar made a really good point of saying stamp should be <laughs> paired with white fragility for white teachers. And I think it's, it's nice not, combo. 
Right. It's a nice combo. And it's not so much that we're saying, you know, these teachers are, they don't want to teach the book. It's just, it, like I said before earlier, it's a very difficult topic. And right. I work for curriculum writing and it is a scaffolding process. It, it's a huge mind shift. I mean, mm. teachers are creatures of habit, but at the same token, um, even just teaching history and changing the way history is being taught is a mind shift because we're right. moving right now. We're in evolution of the traditional, you know, dates, people, events, move on date where it's not, it's really deep in critical thinking. Um, things aren't just linear things happen uh, or organically and how they happened. It was, you know, they weren't just in vacuum. So I think this is, this puts history also on its head where it's a trend. It's not a transition. It's a basically a timeline, but every single piece is connected where in the past history has always been taught this happened okay it's done something right. else happens and this really gives a really good progression of how what what's happening today started by basically chapter one zurara so i think that's another good piece for the book and i'm going to disagree with you valerie i really think kids in, in middle school are ready because they're at that age right now where they want to discuss, they want to challenge, they want to make change, they're in social impact, they see it all around them. And there may be parts and elements that may need to be broken down for them, especially if they're sixth grade. But I think I've taught eighth grade for a long time, I think they're ready. I think it's a conversation that if they're not having it in school, you know darn well they're having it at home. Because I know I'm having those conversations with my kids and my youngest is 10. And just some of the things that she said blows my mind as well. So I think sometimes we just want to shelter our children from the truth, but they're better well guarded, like you said, Erica, to have the truth for them to protect them later on. So, um, yeah, and our comments are are, are fire. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I was just yes. having one feeling, too, about when you said, was there anything that could be problematic? And I was having a feeling a little bit like, it's one thing for Jason Reynolds to be critical of W.E. Du Bois. I, it might be harder for me to hear a white teacher be critical of W.E. Du Bois. So that's something I might have to wrestle with a little bit myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. I think one one comment I really like Miss um, McHale's comment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's around and um, Val, you alluded to this too. How you can pull out passages mm -hmm. and really dig into them and explore. And he, you know, she's talking about doing it. You know, using take a passage and then take a history text or take a passage, yes. take a, a test a text out of, you know, English language arts, literary text, mm -hmm. and really just dig into it. So like the book has that much richness. So um, one thing, and I'm not to speak for all of us, I think, but like the book needs to be in front of young people mm -hmm. um, in some form or fashion. And I, I agree, like, you know, there's so much in this book in the hands of the wrong person, you know, it, it could be Correct. dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's something that I, I think our young folks are really thirsting for in the middle grades and in high school. And to get get them a passage, at least. I love this comment around mm -hmm. that. Um, I think that's really powerful. And then a lot mm -hmm. of comments about almost using this as like professional development for teachers. I think mm -hmm. that's huge as well. You know, um, and, you know, white fragility is about, you know, white folks lacking stamina to do mm -hmm. work around racism and talk about race. So, yeah, I think if, if you dig in this book, yeah, you better be prepared. You better mm -hmm. have some stamina to get through this book. Um, because it is about racism, right? right? So, so do you two think that teaching this book would provide equity and or diversity? Does it not? Is it a no brainer? Yes, it should be part of the curriculum. What's your take on stamped being that kind of that equalizer when it comes to teaching, especially for history, when it's been so whitewashed for forever? Yeah, I think no brainer in that. Yes, it, it's going to move move the um, move the conversation along in a way that I think it has not <laughs> been pushed um, before. So, absolutely moves it along. Mm -hmm. This, this um, the quarantining has really made this. I mean, the the best thing that came out of it is people having to sit still and look at these things and having mm -hmm. opportunities to read that they would not have had. Um, like if you had a choice of this book and another book for your teacher book club, you might go for the easier one, but mm -hmm. right now, <laughs> conversation and you can't get out of it. I am loving this period and the conversations that are coming out of it. And I, I hope that this is a real um, impetus for change. Yes, I hope so too. I think Doug and I are in conversations all the time with teachers and 
people changing curriculum. And we always say if everything that's happening now does not change the way we teach our children and what we teach our children, then we have failed. We can't right. go back to right. the other. And there is no new normal. I think there has to be something new, period. It's not going to be right. normal. It's going to be a total evolution. So um, we're going to check our comments. Um, yeah, a lot, a lot of comments along those same lines. I hope this is real. Um, I yep. think if you look at our discussion this evening, this book is going to make an impact on you. You know, I think mm -hmm. regardless of your race, uh, we talked about it from the perspective of educators, I think non-educators. Um, I do wonder, like I said, once you get this enlightenment and then in the, in, in the midst of what's happening today, you know, with, um, you know, with the pandemic, uh, with the George Floyd tragedy, others who have lost their lives, with, you know, state um, and the result of state sponsored violence, like, will that, will we see a change in action? You know, right. and I'm thinking about our, you know, Valerie and Erica, even in your roles, you know, we talked about Erica's, you know, coming back from part two, looking forward to that, mm -hmm. because I do want to see when you all reconvene in your respective educational spaces, what differences do you all actually see? I, I, right. I just, like I said, there's no way things can be the same. I think people who stay in that spot where they were before all this happened are going to just be out there on, on an island. That's what I believe. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there will be a lot of people maybe spinning around the circle trying to figure out where to go. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking for those that are picking a direction to see what direction they go in and frankly, who's with them as they move in that direction. So yes. uh, to me, this is, this is, this is a, a time like none other. Outside yeah. of our, uh, outside of their classrooms so that they don't have to try to figure it out with our students in front of them. Oh, um, good point. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that they have to think through. Mm -hmm. um, better for them that they're figuring it out before they get back in front of their kids. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. That's, that's why this that's summer is going to be huge in that regard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. So, so just as stamped was the remix, we're going to have definitely a part two. Hopefully we can have both of you back when the school year starts to see Valerie with you and your role as the library media specialist and also Erica with you as the diversity equity liaison with the providing the PD. We would love to, but you know, our show is only about an hour, but we always love to end our show with Doug's famous. So we call it the four by four challenge. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. So we, we honor hip hop around here. And I want to give a shout out to uh, Julia, one of my colleagues. Um, she actually um, tagged me on Twitter and let me know that the U.S. Postal System is coming out with a series of stamps in July mm -hmm. to honor hip hop, which means so much to me. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got uh, the DJ, the MC. Uh, we also have the graffiti artist and the breaker um, slash B-boy slash B-girl. So what we do for the 4 by 4 challenge, we have those four pillars of hip hop. And we ask you as our guest to help us. Uh, you name, now there's a couple ways to do this challenge. If you want to take on the, the true challenge, you name one person from each pillar. You can do it that way. Um, you could name uh, four MCs. You could name two MCs, two DJs, and because it's two of you all and your sisters and we want everyone to <laughs> stay together, if you all, between the two of you, if you want to name four, that's fine as well. Oh, that's we a cannot good idea. let you out of the studio until you give us four hip hop artists. Is that any question? Yeah, you can do one of each. We, we prefer, yes. one, of, we prefer I one of each. The artist, I only know one. I love the very mysterious Banksy. I've been following. Oh, yes. <laughs> very nice. Very nice. Oh, yes. Only one I know, and I think he's also... <laughs> If I mean, we can do current, old, yeah. anything. However you want it. <laughs> cool mo D. Yeah. <laughs> and the leather jacket. Yes. The wow, wow, wow. Right. And, and the leather hat. Cool yes. mo D. All right. <laughs> Eric, then B and Rakim are my yes. favorites. Uh, Doug yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. You got a DJ and an MC there. Okay. All right. <laughs> Love it. Okay. So, so what's the last category? You guys oh, are actually pretty good. If can anybody come up with a with a uh, breaker, a B boy or a B girl? That's the only that's the only category you all have a name between. I saw all the movies in the eighties. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all, right, all right, okay, so, so give me one. Groove and oh, but no, I don't know names. I don't know names either. I haven't. I don't even know what that is. What's a B, B boy? Well, they, they, they used to call it break dancing, but in the culture, break dancing was like the commercialized term. Right. So you could call it a breaker. Is B boy or B girl because you know to be I guess gender neutral um, breaker is an acceptable right. term. So what what was right back when all the movies were coming out and it was being you know marketed through McDonald's and all these other <laughs> <laughs> you know was break you know break dancing right yeah so no no breakers okay all right name one name one give me um, one so mine is Crazy Legs I, I like Crazy Legs he's um, he's been in a couple of the movies. Uh -huh. um, also shows that infusion you got, you know, it's a culture created by 
Black and Latinx um, youth. So he represents Latinx in that regard. So, mm. uh, so that's that's one of mine. So that's good. That's a, the first time I've been challenged on my own challenge. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it. <laughs> yes. So we're gonna check. Um, every Stephanie says. Common, oh, Chuck D, Rosie Perez. Rosie Perez. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. you know, yeah. Good, yeah. very good. Um, Sahar says, thank you for the conversation. We would like to thank both of you ladies for joining us today. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, I know the conversation has evolved over the time. Um, we do hope there will be a part two. We will definitely be in touch. And um, again, thank you again for being on the show. Thank you for having yeah, thank, us. Thank you, ladies. We appreciate you. Thank you. All right. All right, so that was great. Yes. So that was a good conversation. I think we should have a part two because we Absolutely. really need to see what's going on because everybody's hot and heavy now. Mm -hmm. But you know, when the like you said, when the rubber hits the road, what are people mm -hmm. gonna do? Right. When it's in actuality, because we it's a it's a big overhaul. It is a big overhaul. Right. right. So, so um, we, we have a few more yeah, minutes. And yeah, yeah. one thing one thing the guest brought up that I really appreciate is um, and I always talk, I, you know, my thing was there's stages, right? So we had the COVID closure stage. Mm -hmm. um, and then none of us, I think, well, maybe you could predict that a George Floyd situation could happen and Breonna mm -hmm. Taylor and the other folks because it's been happening. Mm -hmm. um, but you had, I guess, this almost, you know, this gripping point in, in, in the world history, if you will. But so we had this closure. We talked about from an education perspective, had the closure. And then we had summertime, which we're starting now. We're kind mm -hmm. of in the midst of that. And then we're going to get into the school year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Abir, you and I know the nature of our jobs. A lot of our work is done in the summer to prepare yes. ourselves, to prepare teachers to be in front of and be with students. Mm -hmm. And I think this is going to be a very telling time, how yes. people show up. And um, I can tell you right now, I got some, I got some, <laughs> I see some people who are struggling. Like, I believe, mm -hmm. like, I just think they're just like out of tune, out of tune, out of touch. And to Erica's point, you put those folks in front of um, students, students who've been through what they've been through over the past right. few months. Now you're going to, you're going to get rocked. And I think you get rocked by students of various races. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Races. Oh yeah. I think right. we're done with the days of like, I remember when I'm growing up, I just used music as an example. When I was growing up, if you listen to metal, you listen only to metal. If you listen mm -hmm. to rap, mm -hmm. you only listen to rap. You know, in Chicago, if you listen to house music, you only listen to house music, yep. you know, those never intersected never came together. now kids are everywhere and yep. even just watching my own children they're calling people out yes. and they're pointing fingers and they are very aware and they're more socially active than we would think they are and i think a yep. really good example is the social media that kids are using even to the point where other people aren't aware that they're using the social media so right. um yeah people are going to struggle but me personally I would rather have a teacher who is struggling and admit that they're struggling and admit that they don't know what's going on and want help than a mm -hmm. person who doesn't want it at all. Right. Because right. at least they're, they're good. And I've, I've worked with teachers like that. Right. And yeah. I think that that's a great point. Are they going to mm -hmm. ask for the help? So number one, are we going to offer it and be open to, you know, let folks mm -hmm. know, like we're here to help. We're not here just to push curriculum out. Right. Strictly. Um, right. And then you, you brought something, you know, I think even the intersectionality, right. I talked about different races, but think about the various ways young people, all people, but the various ways young people can identify. Right. And we know that no matter how you identify, there's a race in there. That's just how it is. Right. Um, well, and our topic is on stamp. So we're talking about race in that regard. But like, I think as I think young people are getting used, like you said, to expressing themselves, mm -hmm. their identities and, and standing for something that is that seems to be um, something we see more and more. And you have those platforms, like you said, with social media. And other platforms. Right. Um, and I think that leads us to what our our next month is going to be about next month um, because I am a child of immigrants uh -huh. um, and things that happen. I always teach my own children that things that happen within the African-American community and what they have uh, contributed to America has benefited us tremendously. So right. we, we owe them a lot, but as a child of immigrants, uh, our next month series is all going to be about um America, uh, we're calling it America, the beautiful ode to immigrants. Mm -hmm. Because when immigrants do come here, they do contribute, but at the same token, they are also working with social changes that are happening because social changes that affect them affect, it's a ripple effect for minority communities in general. You mm -hmm. know, So I think next month um, I'm excited to have an ode to my family 
as a child Absolutely. of immigrants as well. Absolutely. But we also have different people. It, it'd be, it's going to be an interesting um, mix of guests because who we think of as immigrants, we have one or two guests that you're going to be like, oh, yeah, I never really thought of them as being immigrants. Mm -hmm. So we're, hope, we're happy for that. Um, we would like to thank everybody for joining us today. Yes. Uh, you know how to find us. This is my email. And also you can go to my website. What we, what we have now is you can find a copy of the show from the YouTube link. And also there's an extra button on there where you could learn more information. So for example, for this one, we'll have a little bit more information about the book stamped, um, some very interesting uh, articles and uh, interviews by both authors just for people if they want to um, learn anything else. Um, and so basically that would be our show. And let's see what else. I guess everybody's just thanking us and having a good yeah, time. Yeah, and thank you. Right. So we they thank us. Thank you all for being here. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm really looking forward to next month, our topic, um, because I'm thinking about like our friend Keith, he talks about, you know, mm -hmm. Black folks around the diaspora, you know, we identified black um, and some of some black folks immigrated here mm -hmm. and many did not. Right. Or their right. ancestors did not. So really going to be a great topic. Um, oh, and with, talk to us about what we're starting next month. The end of each last show. Uh, of every yes, month yes, is gonna yes. be. So the, starting next month, the last show of the month will have a hip hop focus. So yes. you all know I cannot get enough of hip hop. So we're <laughs> going to take a hip hop, um, basically a hip hop angle on the theme. So starting mm -hmm. in July, we're going to have a hip hop themed show that's also um, connected to the theme of immigration. Yes. Um, so we're going to stay on that theme and we're going to bring immigration into it. And mm -hmm. um, for those that really know hip hop, they can make a clear connection right off the top. Mm -hmm. DJ Cool Herc. Stand up, right? Jamaica, <laughs> immigrant yeah. from Jamaica. So there's so much that we can connect with that. And that's just to show how hip hop is life. So that's one thing we'll be bringing into the last week of um, every show. So looking forward to Excited. kicking that off by next week. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that's yeah. Doug's baby. So he's going to nurture the baby. Yes. We love it. All right. All right. All right. All right. So, All right. so thank we'll you everyone see everybody for joining next us. Week. Yeah, everyone. Yeah. Take care. Be safe. All right. Peace. All right. Peace.